Final speaker for this session, uh, Paul Newman. He's a market sector lead on uh, DOD uh, projects, and he's with ECT2. Um, he's going to be talking about concentrations and destructive technologies overview for uh, complete PFAS treatment solutions. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Jim. Uh, is this a pointer here? Yeah. The green. There's no pointer. Oops. Wrong way. Sorry. <laughs> this is the red. They don't give us a training course on that. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> I don't see a pointer here. Okay. Well, wing it. I don't know about you, you guys. Over there and dance and I think so. <laughs> I see a safety problem right away. I, I don't know about you guys, but I'm kind of hungry for a hamburger after that time. <laughs> so, uh, well, thanks everyone. Appreciate the opportunity to be here and speak with you today. Uh, what I'm going to be speaking about is a very, very long title sustainable ion exchange resin of destruction technologies. And these are really ex situ destruction technologies. You know, we're back to the 80s and 90s. We're pumping and treating again, right? PFAS is an issue. We've got to try and control migration. That's where we are. So ex situ technologies is what I'm going to be focusing on today. And really what it boils down to is waste minimization and liability reduction. That's really where the focus of the work that we're doing at ECT2 is. So it's really waste minimization. You need to separate the PFAS from the waste stream that the PFAS is in, then you need to concentrate the amount uh, really to reduce the volume of waste that you end up with, and only then can you de deploy a destruction technology, and I'll talk about some of the work we're doing there. And by destruction technologies, that's when you really reduce your liability. You're not just transferring it from one place to a landfill someplace else. So it's really about waste minimization, separation, concentration, destruction. So why is PFAS, why is destruction of PFAS so important? Well, we all heard from the deputy director this morning from the EPA. I mean, I, his, I think his term was, it's everywhere. It is everywhere. This stuff is so pervasive, it's so ubiquitous in our environment, and we all know these things are called forever chemicals, right? They're not going away on their own. So it's really important that we find a way to fix this. I dare say this is the generational issue that we have as a society with climate change that we need to really get our hands on. It's that significant. So it's been documented there are probable health effects associated with it. A big question is waste ownership and liability. What do you do with PFAS waste once you're finished with it? There are several technologies that I'll talk about today that have been used, you know, kind of go-to technologies, and I'll talk about the waste aspects or consideration with those technologies. I'm not sure why this happened. So this is going on its own, apparently. So uh, voice activated, cool technology. <laughs> So the pathway to PFAS treatment is really, you know, you start by separating the PFAS from the, waste, from the uh, medium it's in. Only then can you concentrate the waste, and I'll go into a little bit more detail of each of those. Once you concentrate that, that's the, when you can destroy the waste. You have to get to, through the concentration step before you can cost-effectively destroy PFAS waste. So again, in summary, you got to separate the PFAS liquid from the PFAS from the, the liquid medium. And again, this is ex situ technologies we're talking about. And then you reduce the volume by doing so. And then you concentrate PFAS. And there are a number of technologies out there that can do this. A few that we're really excited about are foam fractionation. And I'll go into more detail about what each of these technologies are. And then regenerable ion exchange resin. We have the capability to take ion exchange resin and basically once it's saturated with PFAS, we can regenerate it in place and put it back in service, distill the waste to a very small volume, and then deploy destruction technologies on it. There are multiple technologies showing promise on the destruction front, but it's really early days in terms of working out what technologies are going to be able to scale up in the long term for PFAS destruction. So I'll talk a little bit first about who is ECT2, Emerging Contaminants Treatment Technologies. And then I'll look at the first part of it, separation and concentration technologies. I'll talk about granule activated carbon versus single use ion exchange. I'll talk about regenerable ion exchange and how that compares. I'll talk about foam fractionation and provide a few case studies regarding some, wa some kind of difficult waters that we've treated, landfill leachate, which we know can be kind of a witch's brew, and uh, industrial wastewater. 
and then I'll talk a, a little bit on destruction technologies. I won't go into a lot of detail on the destruction side. This is going to be more about the concentration and how do you end up with a very small volume of waste. So ECT2 was formed in 2013 by a few folks, uh, one of whom Steve Woodard, graduate from Purdue, and saw the potential to utilize resins to treat emerging contaminants like 1,4-dioxane and PFOS in liquid waste streams. And since that time, we've grown as a company, and we're able to treat a variety of different media, going from investigation-derived waste, groundwater, surface water, construction dewatering liquids, soil washing effluent. We heard this morning from Deputy Director Hockey talk about the project at Eielson Air Force Base, where they've got 130,000 cubic yards of material. What do you do with it? Well, what you do with it is you do a soil washing project. And we were just awarded this project. We're on the team that's going to be doing this project here over the next few years. We've got another team member who handles the kind of mechanical separation side of the soil treatment. And then what we do is we handle the water coming off the soil washing process. So we can, we've learned a lot of things uh, in our process. It starts right at the top. We have a research and development laboratory in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, where we do a lot of column testing, where we do pilot testing. We have mobile pilot testing. We can units we can deploy to the field, and we kind of provide the, the full spectrum that most of you as consultants are used to providing for your clients, right? From everything from design through O&M. So we'll talk about first about the state of technology. And if you go to ITR's website for ex situ field implemented treatment technologies, they consider ion exchange resin, uh, both single use and regenerable ion exchange resin as quote unquote field implemented technologies. Uh, also granule activated carbon and reverse osmosis. I'll talk about those first two. And if you look at this graph, what I've done is kind of listed the attributes on the long, along the left hand column and then granule activated carbon, single use ion exchange, and regenerable ion exchange across the top. The difference between ion exchange as a, a mechanism um, for treatment versus, say, granule activated carbon, or GAC, I'll refer to it as, GAC just basically relies on adsorption, where you have the dual mechanics of ion exchange with adsorption with ion exchange. So it makes it much more effective. The kinetics are much more rapid in terms of removing PFOS from the liquid waste stream. And what we see also, it's very effective, ion exchange is very effective for uh, both short chain compounds. P you'll hear people talk about what are short chain PFOS compounds, and generally those have you know, carbon atoms less than seven, and then longer chains are longer. And uh, that's a surprise, right? <laughs> <laughs> so um, if you look at the effectiveness, ion exchange is, is great for both. What happens with granule activated carbon you have, it requires an empty bed contact time, or EBCT, of a longer period. And what empty bed contact time refers to is the amount of time that your wastewater is in contact with the medium that it's passing through in that vessel. So with granite activated carbon, it, it needs longer time to be able to absorb onto the carbon. Ion exchange, it is much quicker. So the result of that is that you end up with granule activated carbon much larger vessels, a much larger system, a larger footprint, in a larger building generally. So, and then you generate correspondingly larger quantities of waste associated with that. If you are disposing of your waste once it's saturated, you're going to end up with a larger volume going to a landfill or, you know, in the case of regenerable land exchange, nothing really going to a landfill. You can regenerate it in place. Here's how this plays out in the field. This was a project that we worked on in um, Australia at Royal, Air, Royal Australian Air Force Williamtown. We got on site back in 2016. Um, somebody from Australian Defense attended a presentation that one of our principals was giving. They had the system kind of in the middle picture here, a granular activated carbon system on site. And they had concentrations in the influent roughly, you know, 6.6 .6 micrograms per liter, or parts per billion. They were going through a lot of granule activated carbon. You can see how many vessels there are in that picture on the left. The picture on the right, that's the same scale that was taken a, about a year later once we got a regenerable ion exchange treatment system in place. And if you look at the waste generated, or the amount of burgers that are generated, 914 burgers in the granule activated carbon system to date, whereas we've regenerated, uh, 
generated only seven tons of waste. And that's largely associated with pretreatment. The thing is with PFAS or any PFAS uh, solution, it, it's not a single solution in many cases. It's often a treatment train. And you really need to look at the water chemistry parameters. You need to look at what species are present. Are they short chain compounds, longer chain compounds? All of those drive what your solution is going to be. And of course, regulatory criteria. We know that those numbers are not going up and we're expecting MCLs to be promulgated, draft MCLs in December, we learned this morning. So, you know, you got, bottom line, with grant activated carbon, you end up with larger systems, single use uh, and regenerable line exchange, you, much larger systems, smaller footprint. So the, a little bit more detail on the technology. If you look at the, de on the left-hand side of this figure, on the bottom left, you'll see influent water goes into that schematic vessel, right? Clean water goes up the top. Once that vessel gets saturated, when it can no longer treat PFOS, you typically have these in a lead and lag arrangement, right? So you take that one vessel offline and you pass a regenerant solution back through the vessel in a counterflow direction. What that does is that regenerant solution strips the PFOS off of those ion exchange sites. Then you can put that vessel back in service then you distill the, vessel, the amount of the regenerant solution back down, and it's a closed loop system, there's no release to the environment. So you distill down the regenerant solution, and you actually end up with a very, very small amount of liquid waste that could be then put on a media, which we call our superloader, or it can be sent for destruction. So there's significant waste reduction uh, results when you do that. It's a very effective a treatment, and through the regeneration process, we've been doing this in Australia since 2017, we found that there is no degradation whatsoever in the ability of the resin to continue to perform and do its job of PFAS removal. So here's an example of where we implemented these, uh, this regenerable ion exchange system treatment technology um, here in the US. This was a Pease Air Force Base. We installed a system back in 2017, installed it in uh, 2018, and we were treating water associated with a former fire training area where typically your PFAS concentrations are pretty high. In this case, they're between 50 to 100 parts per billion or micrograms per liter. And so treating at a rate of between 120 to 200 GPM, um, we've basically been at non-detect since startup. We've treated 70 million gallons of water through that system all we've generated is 70 gallons of PFAS waste. Nothing has gone off-site. We've generated no waste that has gone off-site. That 70 gallons is being used by several providers who are trying out their destruction technologies to see if they can commercialize their technology. We're working with OnVector at a site in Joint Base Cape Cod right now, where they're, they're using their plasma technology on our still bottoms. And we also had a project at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base with AECOM, uh, same sort of thing where they're trying their defluoro technology on our still bottoms. So considerable waste minimization. So if we look at the burger chart on the right, we have 195 burgers. Given one year, if you were to install a granular activated carbon system, you had 185 drums of waste going off every year in perpetuity, whereas we're generating less than one drum per year. So you can see when you then take that less than one drum, then you have a means to deploy destruction technologies. And, and that's where we're going as a company, and that's where I think, that's where the industry is going. That's the holy grail in terms of PFAS, right? These are forever chemicals. How do we get rid of these? Destruction technology is the new frontier. So where it gets exciting too, and where you can get real cost efficiencies, I've described the system on the left, a permanent system at Pease Air Force Base. What we installed in Australia is what we refer to as a hub and spoke system. And the concept being you have these individual treatment systems around a military base because it's, we all know there's more than one <laughs> release site at any military base, right? So then you have the individual treatment systems and you can have a central regeneration plant. And so you defray the cost of that regeneration plant and you're treating all four of those treatment sites. What you do is, you know, again, you take the forkliftable vessels, you bring it to the regeneration site. The regeneration process takes about one day to do, and then you bring them back. So it's kind of, you know, they're doing the regeneration vessel shuffle at the base. 
Um, another technology that uh, we're pretty excited about is foam fractionation. Uh, foam fractionation is it's really a, a repurposed technology. This has been used in the aquarium industry for years, for decades, in fact. So, you know, you go to a place like SeaWorld, they use these big darn vessels, and basically they're fish protein skimmers. And the idea is that basically you're introducing, you know, water goes into this vessel, and I'll show a graphic of how this works, but it's a very simple technology, and it, it can be a really effective pretreatment step. Uh, it's agnostic to a lot of water chemistry parameters that can otherwise kind of bugger up treatment systems. And again, it, it's, it's a great technology, it's a great pretreatment technology. I don't believe it's going to be a technology that's going to get to the cleanup levels that are required or going to be required in the future. But I think, like many other parts of a treatment train, is it has its place for particular types of waste streams, particularly like landfill leachate, industrial um, wastewater, or groundwater hotspots. So we're pretty excited about this technology. And the idea, the way it works is most PFAS, PFAS compounds are surfactants, right? They have a hydrophobic tail and they have a hydrophilic head, and so they like to partition to the air-water interface. And that, of course, that's why they've been used in aqueous film-forming foams, or AFFF for years. They basically create that barrier and smother the oxygen and fuel source. So how it works, in a little bit more detail, uh, PFAS-impacted water comes in from the left in the influent. You have this vessel. Uh, which is a fractionator or protein skimmer. Air is introduced for the bottom. You know, we're back to air sparging, right? But it's a little bit different. You're basically introducing very, very small micro bubbles, and there's a lot of work being done to optimize that process in terms of how the air is introduced, what's the right size of bubble. You want to have foaming, you don't want to have too much foaming. Um, and then you're basically splitting uh, the stream into two. You have a, a foam that comes out the top that's really rich in PFAS because all the PFAS sticks to the bubble, not all of it. A large proportion of the PFAS sticks to the bubbles coming out of the top, and then you have what's called raffinate, which is the water that passes through, which has had a lot of PFAS removed. It's, in some cases, it's suitable for discharge. In other cases, polishing steps are required. This is an example of a foam fractionation pilot test we did on some landfill leachate, and what I think multiple vendors are all kind of finding the same thing that, um, You've, we've talked about short-chain compounds versus long-chain PFOS compounds. The short-chain compounds are the ones kind of listed at the top, PFBA, PFBS, PFPA, et cetera. And the number of carbon molecules go from four, C4 at the top down to C8 for PFOA and PFOS at the bottom. And we've depicted that on the right. Again, C4 on the left going to C8. Generally, foam fractionation works really, really well for the longer compounds. Shorter compounds, particularly the really low ones, C2, 3C, are more problematic. And so there's a lot of work underway to develop boosting agents that can augment the natural process of that foam separation. So here's a case where we were working for an industrial manufacturer, and you won't recognize poly F1 and poly F2. Those are proprietary compounds. This, this client actually manufactured PFOS compounds. So, you know, we did a lot of work in the laboratory, used a, a boosting agent referred to as FF1, and without the boosting agent, we were able to get PFOS removal in the range of 21 to 87 percent, but by addition of those compounds, uh, the surfactants, we were able to get between 92 to 99 percent PFOS removal. And, you know, there's a lot of talk about percent removal. Does that get you there? Does that get you to the cleanup criteria that are going to be required? Likely not, but this could be a really valuable and relatively cost-effective, kind of keep it simple, stupid sort of pretreatment step, right? So where does it fit in? You know, it's really good. It depends where it fits in, I guess. So it depends on the influent PFOS concentrations, whether you have shorter, or short chain or long chain PFOS compounds, or you're looking for it as a sole pretreatment step or as a treatment uh, step on its own whether it's a final remedy or an interim action. There are a lot of different things, but you know, I think the best way to get there, as we all know, been in the environmental professional profession for several years, pilot testing is a, a really invaluable tool to look at it for your site. So it all, this is just a complicated figure that says you can operate these things in parallel or in series. So <laughs> you don't need to look at the detail. That's basically what it says. So here is a, a video, hopefully this will play, and we have 
sufficient volume, but this is a, a pilot system uh, that we had deployed at a landfill in Missouri. And this kind of walks you through the, the process. It's always just easier to see things with your own eyes rather than listen to me show a graphic on it. Oh, of course. Is there any volume adjustment we can do back there? In varying flow rates, and it's controlled by an electronic valve. We bring water into the first fractionator in the series. Each one of the two fractionators carries 300 gallons of water. They also have a recirculation pump, which is responsible for also drawing in air. Air is mixed with the water in the tank. It creates a foam, which is drawn off the top to convey its piping into a foamate tank. The foamate liquid collects in this tank where it can be sent for destruction. On the floor here, we have two chemical injection pumps. Each one is responsible for delivering a dose of surfactant to each one of the fractionators. We use that to help augment the foam and to increase the amount of PFOS removal in the process. This fractionator is the second fractionator in the series. What wasn't removed in the primary fractionator is removed in the secondary. The water that flows out of the secondary fractionator is considered treated water and then flows to the outfall tank and there is a pump that pumps it out of the box as treated water. Yeah, so this is a case at this landfill where they had their own water treatment plant and they wanted to use this as a pretreatment step to really knock, knock the hell out of it, knock down the PFAS concentrations before it went to that plant. All right, so I'll just go through uh, on-site destruction pretty quickly. There are a number of technologies that are kind of currently being tested in various capacities by some, you know, Really smart people are working on this stuff right now. A lot of universities are really kind of driving these technologies forward. Ones that we're particularly excited are plasma, electrochemical oxidation, supercritical water oxidation, and hydrothermal alkaline treatment. You know, they all have their place depending on what type of waste it is. Um, and, but again, you know, to make them practical, the key to making the destruction practical is you, you need to be able to deploy destruction on a small volume of liquid. And that's, you know, the foamate that comes out of the foam fractionators, that is another case where you have a small volume, because those bubbles that all collect, they all kind of condense down into a liquid of small volume. So plasma, uh, basically it's an ionized gas, destroys through redox uh, reactions, and this is one where DMAX, uh, their technology developed by Clarkson University showed pretty strong uh, destruction of like 99% of PFAS. And you can see this was a field operation where they had uh, their system mounted in a trailer. Electrochemical oxidation, we worked in concert with AECOM. AECOM's defluoro unit is there on the right that they developed with the University of Georgia and had some pretty good results at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. This is newer technology, hydrothermal alkaline treatment being driven by uh, Colorado School of Mines in Aquaga. And it's, uh, it's a little, easier to implement because you're not working at, like SQUO, you're not looking at working at, um, sub you're working at subcritical pressures and temperatures. Uh, and they've been able to get complete destruction of PFAS, including short chain compounds. Here's just a brief overview that kind of highlights some of the successes, but some of the challenges associated with on-site destruction. This is a depiction showing of concentrations at 250 micrograms per liter on the left-hand side. And you can see treatment, the reaction time, operated in batch mode, kind of went over a period of like six hours. So you're going to see technology is going to operate in batch mode, kind of continuing to recirculate liquids. Scaling up is going to be the challenge for these technologies, but that's where a lot of the work is going right now. So in summary, uh, you really can't destroy PFAS until you concentrate it, and there's some good ways to do that. But every site is different. Every, you know, water chemistry is different at every site. There's no one-size-fits-all solution. So we're exa excited to be part of it, and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Yes, sir. At the IDW stage, I think, I think that's a good fit for something like single-use ion exchange resin. Because in many cases, IDW, you know, you don't have smoke and hot concentrations. You don't have a large volume of liquid that you're dealing with. So, you know, simpler is always better, right? It can be as simple as having, you know, a granule activated carbon kind of pretreatment vessel followed by an ion exchange treatment vessel 
where the, the ion exchange vessel is doing the heavy work and is able to get to those low detection limits. And then, you know, if you're dealing with dewatering liquids, well, you may have a sand filter on the front of that. It gets increasingly more complex as the matrix gets a little fuzzier, right? So how does that system uh, handle kind of liquid with high amounts of uh, spent salt like drilling mud? Yeah. What we prefer, to, I mean, we, the mantra at our place is protect the resin, right? So what we try to do is put as many set, like settling tanks in the front of that as possible. So a frack tank is a great way to do that. You could have frack tanks on the upside, then you go through a treatment system, then you put the water, treated water, into a frack tank, wait for analytical results to come back, then you're in a position to release them. And if you haven't met your treatment goals, then you can recirculate back through the system. So in some cases, you know, we have the upfront settling tanks, you may have sand filters, you may have bag filters, it may be all of that, just depending on you know, what flow rate you're dealing with and the nature of the the PFAS in there. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, if I looked at the example for the Air Force, Royal Australian Air Force, you know, that seven tons of waste, that's all pretreatment media. So that's the GAC, and that is, say, maybe green sand. There is rarely a case that we would install just a single-use ion exchange system. We use GAC all the time. But what happens is, because the empty bed contact time for really effective GAC treatment is so high, the flow rates, a lot of the stuff just passes through the GAC, right? And then you save the ion exchange media to do the heavy lifting of the treatment. So there is a waste associated with that pretreatment, but it's a necessary step to maintain the integrity of the ion exchange resin that you need. And that gap is part of your really reduced uh, seven hammers? Yes, it is, yes. Yeah. We've got a question up, up front. Yes. Hi. What I was saying with 185, it, there's two scenarios painted in those graphics. The first of which, if they would have treated water just using granule activated carbon, they would have run through 185 drums of gar uh, carbon per year and had to dispose of that off-site. The, the one burger, less than one burger, you see what you've done? <laughs> the less than one burger is, that's basically the w amount of uh, waste that's generated by concentrating the PFAS, treating it and then concentrating it, you're generating less than one drum per year. Right, so from the drum construction perspective, mm -hmm. is that this, uh, the current technology for construction is preferred to construct as a one drum or, uh, uh, or 185 drums? So the economics of it definitely favor I think, you know, I think you can look at it pretty simply in that if you're going to deploy a destruction technology, you, you may deploy a different one on granular activated carbon than, say, the P concentrated PFAS waste. But just keep that equal for the purpose of discussion. The whole thing is about minimize the amount of waste. Assume your, co your cost of destruction is going to be relatively the same. If you're going to be destroying 185 drums per year, you're going to be spending a lot of money forever. Whereas if you're only destroying one drum of highly concentrated PFAS waste, it's much less. And then if you can destroy that, if you can leverage a destruction technology on that one drum, then you know, that's the holy grail, because you've minimized that off-site liability of where you're transferring the waste to. Did I answer your question? Okay, okay thank you. All right.
I'm going to ask you a question. Oh, to, sure, Jim. Not going to get away. Um, we don't have. It's not three o'clock yet, so we still got a couple minutes. Okay. Um, you know, as you talked about these technologies, obviously the front end water quality mm -hmm. coming in is, yeah. is important. Um, can you speak at all to how you're addressing um, water chemistry as it pertains to things like? iron and calcium, especially like on the, say, the foaming technologies yeah. where, you know, our traditional, say, the old days, air stripper, right? You get right. any bit of calcium and you got right. all kinds of carbonate yeah. problems and, and iron. How, how are those being, are those all being accounted for in your system? That's all being accounted for uh, in the pretreatment stage, Jim, and really it's the pilot testing that really informs exactly how that's done. And so we use a number of different media, not just during the treatment stage, but during the pretreatment stage. Pretty much everything we use, you know, with the exception of a technology like uh, foam fractionation, is a granular type of media. It could be a green sand filter. It could be granular activated carbon. So it, it all depends on the situation. Yep. All right, well, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Appreciate it.